Welcome to the Performing Arts Series brought to you by the Kennedy Center and the Prince William Network. I'm Maria Salvador, your moderator for today's program. There are many ways to tell stories and Jacqueline Woodson has used many of them. She's a picture book author, a novelist, and a poet for young readers. Her books have received many awards, including three Newbery Honors, a Coretta Scott King Award, a National Book Finalist, and for her significant contribution to young adult literature, Ms. Woodson has received the prestigious Margaret Edwards Award. Now Jacqueline Woodson has adapted her award-winning novel, Locomotion, for the stage, becoming a playwright. Locomotion, in both forms, novel and stage, is about 11-year-old Lonnie Collins' motion, nicknamed Locomotion, whose life moves from loss to gain, from heartbreak to hope. He discovers the power of poetry to explore and express his feelings about his sister, the death of his parents, uh, and his new life with a caring foster parent. Today, we'll talk about this novel and what was needed to translate it into another medium. It's good to be with you, Jackie. It's nice to be here. Uh, you've said that your books are not always physically autobiographical, but always emotionally autobiographical. And you go on to say that every feeling my characters have had is a feeling that you have had. So where did Lonnie's story come from? Huh. I think um, Lonnie's story started a long time ago. I, when I look back on Lonnie, I feel like I see myself as a young person learning to find my voice through poetry and um, learning to tell my story as an adult. And I feel like there's so much of me inside of the character of Lonnie, the emotional Lonnie, not necessarily the physical Lonnie, obviously. But, um, but he, his story, I feel like, started with my story of becoming a writer. All right. You've, you, you, you've been a writer for some years now. But how is being a, a, a novelist, a book creator, different than being a playwright? <laughs> I think um, writing novels is a very internal and isolated act. And um, I have the voices of the characters inside my head, but I don't have the rest of the world. And I think um, writing for the stage is a very in external act. Um, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking about audience. I'm thinking about what they're seeing. I'm thinking about the way people are moving around on the stage. I'm thinking about lighting. I'm listening to my director talk. I'm thinking about costumes and all of these things. When I'm writing fiction, if I say my character has on a pair of gray pants, that's a big description for me. A lot of it is more brush um, stroking, just ideas of what characters look like and where. And I have to be much more concrete on the stage. And, um, and it can't happen inside their heads the way it can in fiction. It has to be made into action. Well, poetry figures prominently in both the novel and in the play, but as you described the characters, they, they work differently. Poetry works differently. Um, talk, talk about that. Describe how. I think um, in the perfect world, people wouldn't get bored of poetry. I think if I had tried to just have Lonnie on the stage reciting his book, that I might have lost my audience. And that was something I was very, I, I felt like I needed to create a, create a whole new dramatic arc in the story. I had the narrative arc in the novel, but for the stage, something different had to be done. So I couldn't have him telling us his story. I had to once again show it. And I do show it in the novel, of course, but I show it differently. So I had to re-envision how he was gonna get that story out. And while I do use a lot of poetry, I couldn't use all poetry. But you liken people to poetry. Um, would you read the, the dedication uh, and go through uh, the opening of the play, or the novel, rather? Okay, so usually in novels, there's a dedication from the author to the reader. And I started with my dedication. And then I followed that with Lonnie's dedication, which is name all the people you're always thinking about. People are poems. Lonnie C. Motion. And continue on. Read, read the, the first poem in, in the novel. Okay. Um, this is called Poem Book. This whole book's a poem because every time I try to tell the whole story, my mind goes, be quiet. 
Only it's not my mind's voice, it's Miss Edna's over and over and over. Be quiet. I'm not a loud kid, I swear. I'm just me, and sometimes I make a little bit of noise. If I was a grown-up, maybe Miss Edna wouldn't be telling me to be quiet all the time, but I'm 11, and maybe 11's just noisy. Maybe 12's quieter. But when Miss Edna's voice comes on, the ideas in my head go out like a candle, and all you see left is this little string of smoke that disappears real quick before I have a chance to find out what it's trying to say. So this whole book's a poem, because poetry short. And this whole book's a poem because Miss Marcus says, write it down before it leaves your brain. I tell her about the string of smoke thing and she says, good Lonnie, write that. Not a whole lot of people be saying good Lonnie to me, so I write the string of smoke thing down real fast and Miss Marcus says, we'll worry about those line breaks later. Write fast, Miss Marcus says. I'm thinking, yeah, I better write fast before Miss Edna's voice comes on and blows my candle idea out. Well, the play's opening is somewhat different but it captures the emotional essence of the book. You had to change it for the different medium. Why and how? I had to change it for the stage because in the book, you kind of have the patience to grow to love Lonnie. Um, and I felt like on the stage, Lonnie had to capture your heart immediately. So he had to come at you and say, look, here I am. And he had to start with something that was universal and familiar. And in this case, it opens with the mother poem and where he talks about missing his mom and who can't relate to what it means to miss someone you love dearly. So, um, so I restructured it and started with that moment of here I am, I'm human, and here is what we share. So that's how it opens now. It doesn't open with the introduction of poetry, as this book does. I mean, he does it in poetry, but it doesn't open with him introducing himself as a poet, but rather introducing himself as a human being. Um, we're going to see a bit of the, the play now. So let's, let's hear from the stage. Now you can call me Miss Edna, and the first thing you need to know about me is I've gotten used to my quiet. Used to be a loud house when my son was living here, but that was a long time ago. So, here it is. This is my kitchen. If you drink the last milk, you let me know. Don't just put the empty container back in the fridge with two drops of milk in it. I don't like the bread end, so if that is all that is left in the bag and not something you like either, you let me know. Clear? The living room's down that hall. I keep it neat and expect it to stay that way. Right off is where you'll sleep. You get up, you make your bed. Your door stays open in the daytime. At night, you can close it. There's another room down the hall. No need for you to ever go in there. Okay. That's Jenkins' room. I got a letter from him today. I keep his room ready. <clears throat> I like things ready. And quiet. No loud noises, no rap blasting to my house. <clears throat> you get it. Sit down. <clears throat> I expect you to... We need to figure out how this is going to work. The two of us living here quietly. I roasted a chicken. Going to heat that up for dinner and make some peas and rice. I'm sure you're hungry, aren't you? It is a yes or no question. I'll ask it again. Are you hungry? Yes. Well, go get yourself settled in your room and I'll start warming things up. It's been a long day for everybody.
At night sometimes, after Miss Edna goes to bed, I come up here on the roof. Sometimes I sit counting the stars. Maybe one is my mama and one is my daddy. And maybe that's why sometimes they flicker a bit. The stars flicker. Flashbacks, memories are revealed in locomotion, but are handled differently for the stage. It's approached differently in the play. Uh, could you discuss how the whole memory flashback is, is handled? In the book, flashbacks are um, not carelessly dropped in there. I, I feel like there's a kind of law about writing novels that you can't use too much flashback or else you'll lose your reader. And so there, it, it, the flashbacks come um, very seldomly in the book, but you get a lot of it through his action and interaction and reaction. But um, in the play, because I write it as a memory play, we weave in, out of, in and out of Lonnie's present and past, and there's a fluidity of it there's a fluidity to it that I felt like I could, I understood enough to be able to create on the stage. And because it is a memory play, it's basically about him living through this memory every day and what that means and how that changes him. The rest of the class needs to copy the homework assignment. As you can see, aside from writing in your journals this evening, I will be checking them, you have history homework. I want you to read pages 112 to 121 regarding Brown versus the Board of Education. And make sure... And make sure you hold Lily's hand, Lonnie. And hurry on back because Sarah will Come be Come on, Daddy. I'm eight years old. You think I can't cross one street? Like, I know you're eight. But you're the only eight-year-old I got. And Lily's my only five-year-old. And me and your mama ain't planning to have any more kids. So just hold her hand and hurry on back. Because Sarah will be here to pick y'all up. And what? I said Sarah's coming to get y'all. But I don't want to go to Sarah's oh, house Lonnie, tonight. Oh, Lonnie, just hush and hold my hand. Come on. <sighs> Ew. Why is it so sticky? <sighs> I saved the part that's almost to the Tootsie Roll for you, Lonnie. <laughs> <laughs> Lonnie? Yeah? What's Santa Claus's true color? You always ask me that and I always tell you. He's all different colors. Like a rainbow? Like a people rainbow. He's brown and white and Puerto Rican and Korean. Then what color is Santa Claus's mama? Well, uh, she's rainbow too, the same like Santa. Lonnie, what, how what? come some people be saying there's no such thing as Santa Claus? Because a part of their mind is broken. Somebody broke it and it was a part that knew all about Santa. How did they get their mind broke? Uh, well, uh, people say stuff to you over and over and you start believing it's true, even if it's not. You start believing it and the thing you used to believe gets all broken into little pieces and disappears. Well, nobody's ever going to break my mind, right? Right. Lonnie! <laughs> what, Lily? If anybody ever tries to break my mind, will you fix it? I'm not going to let anybody break your mind. Good. You know what? What? I wouldn't trade you for a hundred Santa Clauses. <laughs> I know that, Lily. A million times I know that. I know that, Lily. A million times I know that. I know that, Lily. A million times I know that. I know that, Lily. A million times I know that. Even though the themes are serious, there's humor in the play. Lonnie worries about Miss Edna singing to herself. Lonnie is concerned that Miss Edna's mind is broke, and the notion of a mind being broke recurs throughout. Talk about that. I think there is this part of me that does believe that people can get brainwashed into believing and thinking things they really 
don't believe and think. And I, I think that's my idea of what the mind being broke is about, um, quote unquote, the mind being broke. Um, but I, I think that it's important in terms of these two characters, Lily and Lonnie, that they stay strong and hold, keep this memory intact instead of thinking of it as something that has to be erased so that they could survive. And, and for me, I didn't want their minds broken in that way to think that in order to go forward, I need to forget the past. And I think the past in everyone's life is so important to who they become and to let your mind get broken and not remember that past to me feels tragic. So it does come up a lot. My Jenkins gonna be all right. My Jenkins gonna be all right now. <laughs> My uh, Jenkins gonna Ms. be all Edna, right. Edna, you okay? My Jenkins all right. Miss Edna, you okay? Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, God, I, I know I don't be asking you for a whole lot, but please don't let Miss Edna's mom be broke because I, I was just getting used to living here. God, I know me and her don't always get along, but she's all I got right now. No. I just don't want to. What are you doing in my fire escape like that? You scared me. Oh, get in here. Oh, oh I got a letter from Jenkins today. Said he's looking forward to meeting you when he comes home. Yes. Oh, Lord, let this war end so my boy can get here. But he's safe and he's eating. Oh, Lord, I'm just so happy. Oh, 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 oh. Your bed did not get made this morning. Well, I was it's late. It's in so there waiting for you. You know I can't live with messy people. Oh. Boop. <laughs> The warm relationship between Lonnie and Lily is a constant in both the novel and the stage. Uh, one scene that demonstrates it and the individual personalities of the children is the one when Lonnie sees Lily after a long time. He's upset that Lily wasn't available uh, one Saturday, and Lily's response is heartbreakingly truthful. Tell us about that scene. Uh, that scene is about showing Lily and showing how hard it is to have this kind of transition in your life. And like every kid who is eight years old, a part of her just wants to be regular, as she says, and doesn't want to have to report to an agency once a week to meet up with her brother in this artificial setting. She wants to have a warm life filled with light and good smells and and cookie making and just be a normal kid and at the expense of breaking her brother's heart and in that moment she realizes it and he sees what she's going through a little more. Oh, read me the poem you were writing, Lonnie. Is it about mama or daddy? Listen, you'll see. Sometimes I go to Lily's new mama's house That's to now. visit. It's about me! You gonna keep interrupting me? <laughs> I take the 52 bus, and then I transfer to the 69 bus. I walk five blocks, and when I get there, sometimes I see Lily standing in the window, waving and grinning. <laughs> Lily's new mama lives on a pretty block with trees and brownstone houses that all look alike. So if you don't know the address, you end up knocking on a stranger's door, even if you've been there a couple of times before. <laughs> now I know Lily's new mama lives in a house with the yellow curtains on the second floor. My room. And most times with Lily in the window. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, Lon. I gotta tell you something. Yeah? I'm sorry I was missing all those Saturdays. <laughs> well, you had stuff to do. When on one of those Saturdays you were sick. Well, that's not the whole truth. I just wanted to be regular and do all the things that other kids do on a Saturday. You know, like going to parties and making cookies and stuff like that. My mind got broke. <laughs> I, I didn't want to be in that old ugly agency place with all those ugly lights and those people. The fluorescent lights. Fluorescent lights. They made me sad. You could have just told me that. I think I'm still sad, Lonnie. 
except, except for the days when I forget about not living with you, when I make believe I'm regular. Miss Selma's only child. But that's not true. You had a family once. It was four of us. I know that. But if I think about it every day, it makes me feel all in between. Lonnie, it's time for you to head on back home now. Oh, we're just saying our goodbyes, Miss Selma. I don't mind coming over here. I just, I just don't want us to miss any more Saturdays together. Me neither. And in July, we get camp, and then we'll have two, two whole weeks together. It's almost springtime, Lonnie. We don't have that far to go. Read me another poem, Lonnie. All right. Oh, this one's called a haiku. Rain in my sister's hair smells like good things. Springtime, lavender, lily. That's a whole poem? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could have wrote that. <laughs> Characters from the novel have either been eliminated or left out. How did you make these decisions? Well, Kennedy Center said I could either have one character or three. <laughs> and so I knew I couldn't get all the people in that book up on the stage in three characters. And I had to figure out how to use the three act. I'm sorry, one actor or three actors, not one character or three characters. And I had to figure out how to get as many characters as I could into those three actors. And, um, and it, was, it was a challenge, but I, I'm, I'm completely grateful for it because I feel like I did things I would have never have thought of doing, like taking the character of Eric, Angel, and Lamont from the book, the characters from the book, and making them into Enrique, uh, a composite of all of them. And um, figuring out how to move people onto the stage and off the stage so that they can reappear on the stage as someone else and all of that. And it felt like choreography and it felt like poetry. I mean, moving and having people say things that carried them off the stage. So it was actually quite fun in the end. Well, Enrique figures quite prominently in, in the script. How did, you've already talked about how you've come up with him, but what is the, is the um, what makes Enrique special? I think what makes Enrique special is the actor G. <laughs> For one thing, I think the actor playing Enrique is amazing. I think they're all amazing. Uh, and each time G comes onto the stage as Enrique, it feels like this light comes onto the stage and this energy and he's all these things. And I think, wow, I can't believe I wrote those lines for him. <laughs> and so I think another thing that makes Enrique pop that way is because he is such a complicated character, he's dealing with sickle cell and he's discovering that he's a poet as well and he's trying to figure out his close friend and, um, and he's struggling in school and, and, and trying to be a clown about it, but really not wanting to be struggling in school. And for me, it gave me a chance to really put some humor in there and, and not at the expense of anyone, but just show this person who can have all the struggle and be able to laugh constantly, which I think is important. The notion of self-expression uh, connects the play and the stage production. Ms. Marcus tries to promote poetry as a means of, of, doing, of doing just that. Let's see where Ms. Marcus uh, talks about the power of poetry. Describing people is not poetry. It's just, it's just stuff. It's just things that happen. But it's stuff that happened to you. It's your memories. It's your poetry. No, it's not. It's just some things that's in our head and you're trying to tell us it's poetry. I mean, something's, something's missing from our words. It's, it's different than the poetry you read to us. What is poetry then? Good question. But nobody asked it. I'm asking it, Enrique. What is it to you? Irrelevant. <laughs> Good word, huh, Ms. Marcus? Irrelevant, meaning it has nothing to do with me whatsoever? I hate poetry. It's stupid. 
That poem you read us about the guy being in the woods and his, in the snow and his horse thinking he's crazy or whatever? What the frick frack has that got to do with me? I don't have no horse. But your grandpops has one in Puerto Rico. That's what you said, unless you was lying. I wasn't lying. In Arecibo, where my mom's family's from, they're horses. Oh, and they're strong, yo. They stand, if you stand in front of them, they kick you because of how their eyes are on the side and they can't see in front. And they're strong. Or, or as my mom's family be saying, son muy fuertes. <laughs> Look at you speaking your Spanish. My mom's Puerto Rican. I better speak some Spanish. But you black. My dad's black. Too black, too strong. Got the best of both worlds going on. How, how's that? How's what? Describe what's familiar to you, the best of both worlds. Yo, my mom throws down in the kitchen. Yo, she makes the best bacalaitos of anyone, no lie. And my dad, well, he's just, he's just mad cool. I mean, you could talk to him about anything. So, good food and good conversation. No lie. Then write that in your journal, just what you said. Why? Because it's real life the things that happen to you. But like I said, we don't have no woods in Brooklyn. <laughs> Which is why Robert Frost wrote that poem and not you. You're not Robert Frost, so don't write about the same things as he does. Yeah, because he's dead and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff, all of it, Arecibo, the meals your mother makes, all of it matters. Write it down, it's your experience. For the test? For you, Enrique, it's your life. Write it any way you want for you. Like rap. Like our brothers be talking about their lives and whatnot. Well, I can write it that way? Sure can. Okay. <laughs> Check it. The food be slamming. The mood be jamming. Get to my mama's house before there is a family. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are on to something, Enrique. These are good ideas coming. Why don't you um, write them in your journal first and share them with the class later? But how am I going to write? <laughs> you tell me how to spell. <laughs> I think you'll figure it out. Wait, 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 but my stuff's not funny like Enrique's. It comes out all serious. Well, it's not always fun, Lonnie. Or funny, but it's your story. Whatever comes to you, however it comes to you, just write it. <laughs> Let's start with journal checking this morning. Seven words came to me last night. I want more bacalaitos. I hate poetry. I can write it in Spanish, too. Quiero más bacalaitos. Odio poesía. <laughs> that would make it 12 words. Good beginning, Enrique. So nice to see something in your journal, finally. Now, write down why, the long version, in English and Spanish, if you like. But what about the stuff from yesterday? You said that those were good ideas and that was rap. You want us to write poetry and stuff in here? But rap is poetry, Enrique. One of the most creative kinds. Are you serious? Of course I'm serious. Well, even with the beatbox, if you can't write the beatbox in words? Yes, even if you can't write it in words. Oh, but write it in words, if you can. I got you. Hip-hop rules the world. Hip-hop rules the world! Yo, hip-hop rules the world! I said hip-hop rules the world! Enrique's acting like he just won the lotto. But all it was was Miss Marcus saying, of, of course, course rap, rap is poetry. poetry. One, One of, of the, the most, most creative, creative forms. <laughs> now Enrique's writing lyrics and bopping his head and every chance he gets saying, hip hop rules the world. Saying, hip hop rules the world. Saying, hey dog, guess who else is a poet now? Hip hop rules the world. <laughs> what is the power of poetry? Hmm, I think, um, 
in order to talk about the power of poetry, we have to talk about the power of language. And I think language has the power to change everything. I mean, you can say things in ways that make people feel certain ways and to say the same thing in another way and make them feel a whole different way. And I think the way we put words together is important every day of our lives. And I think really taking the time to look at language in all of its forms, all of its poetic forms, because I think language is poetic, um, is important because it makes us have to stop and think about what we're saying and how we're saying it. And I think for young people, poetry changes the world. It gives people voice. It gives them the tools to tell their stories. It, um, it can be um, deceptively simple. It can be really complex. It can be Enrique's hip hop. It can be, um, you know, um, I don't know. There are so many ways poetry can get into the world and change the world. And, and you know, if we can change the world through poetry, I'm happy. <laughs> well, Enrique actually adapts a poem by, by Langston Hughes. Um, why did you choose Hughes's poetry? Langston Hughes was one of the first poets I fell in love with and one of the first poets I really understood. I remember the first time I read, you know, well, son, I tell you life for me ain't been no crystal stairs, ain't been no crystal stair. And I just realized I understand this poem. And I was in fifth grade and I'm like, I understand what this mother is saying to this son. And then um, I love my friend. He went away from me. Um, there's nothing more to say. The poem ends same as it begins. I love my friend. Okay, last night's assignment. I asked each of you to write a poem in your journals to be read out loud to class. Again, I expect no stumbling over words you scribbled down and now can't decipher. I expect loud, clear voices, original ideas, and a good time. Who wants to start? Enrique! Haha! <laughs> you thought you had me, huh, Miss Marcus? But look, right here. I got it, see? Page two of Enrique's journal clearly shows a well-executed poem entitled, My Dream, adapted by Enrique Anderson. <clears throat> Shall I begin? Please do. <laughs> to fling my arms wide in some place of the sun, to whirl and to dance till the white day is done. Then rest a pale evening beneath a tall tree while night comes on gently, black like me. That is my dream. <laughs> nice, huh? Yo, E, that's sweet. <laughs> Very sweet, Enrique. And it was sweet when Langston Hughes first wrote it and called it... Dream Enrique. Variations in 1926. I know. I know Langston wrote it first. That's why I said adapted by. <laughs> because you and me both know that to adapt is to change in order to improve or make more fit for a particular situation. <clears throat> From the Latin adaptare, to fit to. And if you'll be so kind as to let me continue, I can gift you with the rest of the poem. <clears throat> Check it. To fling my arms wide in some place of the sun, yo, to whirl and to dance till the, till the what? Till the white day is done. Then rest a pale evening, a tall, slim tree, that's me. While night comes on gently, take it down now. I said a black like me, like who like me? Now back in Langston days, brothers didn't say black. Someone called you that and you was ready to attack. But time moves around, words go underground, different meaning, different sounds, and new definitions abound. Woo! What was once taboo is now all over you. Black like me, I said black like me. So with this poetry comes a little history, laid down by Mr. E, his own sweet creation, a variation on a dream. We're Proster Langston Hughes. <laughs> Yo. Yo. Miss Marcus, he got you. Enrique. You got me. Oh, you're so good. In the book, Lonnie doesn't want to share his poems with Miss Marcus, while in the play, he does so willingly. Does this change the characters fundamentally? 
Um, in terms of how I wrote the characters, Lonnie is different on the stage than he is in the book, but you get the, you get to the same person. I think, um, in the, on the stage, he starts out giving his, us his poetry right away. I'm sorry, in the book, he starts out giving his, us his poetry right away, but not necessarily giving it to Miss Marcus. He's talking to Miss Marcus about it and, and stressing over it, but he's not necessarily showing it to her till later on. And, but, so, but, but, but that moment that we get is now Miss Marcus has already told him that he's a poet. So we go back in time. He's showing us these poems that Miss Marcus hadn't seen I don't know if I'm making any sense there. But anyway, on the stage, he's much more explicit. And we actually get much more of Lonnie's life than his poetry head on. And then we get his poetry. So I don't know if well, that's in, clear. In both the play and, on the, uh, and, and in the novel, he has trouble sharing, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of his story. Uh, so what, is, what allows him to fi finally break through? And... Well, I think the thing that allows him in both cases is Miss Marcus. He has this amazing teacher who says, you have a story, tell it, and you're a poet, be that. And, and a light goes on for him, and he gets brave. So I think that's how it works. <laughs> and for a while, the poem has stopped coming, but... One day it was back again, telling me to keep on going, to keep it moving to the page. Tell me I knew about poetry long before Miss Marcus came along. Lonnie, I'm ready. Only I didn't know I knew until Miss Marcus, Marcus showed me that I did. Because poetry was poetry always was in our house. In our house. Uh, I wrote this one last night. The newspaper, newspaper said, said two, two people, people died. died. And right, and right on, on the, the next line, line it said their names. names. The, the newspaper, newspaper said, said survived by Lily, Lily and Lonnie Motion, motion. Eight. ages five and eight. eight. There was a bus leaving real early for the Bronx Zoo, and Pastor Marshall's daughter was taking a bunch of kids. So we all slept at her house. And Mama and Daddy had a date. And they'd be coming by to pick us up first thing in the morning. So Lily blew Mama a kiss. You think it's still flying through the air You think it's still flying somewhere? through the air somewhere? Amazing. My only question, when did you know that you were a poet? That is my dream. That is my dream. A long, long time ago. Well. Thank you for this. And Lonnie, that journal seems to be pretty full. Time to start another one. I'll be reading it tomorrow. <laughs> um, what do, do the play and the novel share thematically, and where do they go their separate ways? They, the play and the novel, of course, share Lonnie's love of poetry and his fear of kind of being um, the uncool kid who writes. And, and also the fact that his life is so shrouded with other stuff that it's hard to tell the story. Uh, and of course they do it differently. But they um, kind of go their separate ways. And I, I, I see the Lonnie on stage is actually much more vocal than the Lonnie on the page. The Lonnie on the page, it, just like the Jackie who's writing the page, is much more internal. And the Lonnie on the stage is much more external. I mean, in the book, I never imagined Lonnie dancing, and, except when he was dancing with his mother to the song. Um, and on the stage, he's much, he moves so beautifully and he's always moving and um and he has his music i don't think i talked about music at all in the book as the in terms of the music lonnie listens to but on the stage he's much he has a uh, much bigger musicality going on and he's just a different side of lonnie but it's all the same character which makes it really kind of cool um what is the impact 
you, you've, I think you in some ways have answered this, but what is the impact of um, having multiple characters played by three actors? I think the impact is that I get challenged and the audience gets challenged and the audience gets to really come meet the characters and meet the actors in this way that feels very active to me. And I think it's, um, it's a great payoff. But imagination is, is very much at work in both the novel and when you watch the stage production. Definitely. I mean, look, the stage production is amazing. And you do, you, get, you can get lost inside of it. And I felt like when I actually saw the play for the first time that I thought, I never imagined that it would be this easy to watch and that I would be able to be a part of this dream so easily, that I would be able to just sit back in the audience and say, wow, this is an amazing story, and these actors are really telling it. Do, does seeing your characters come to life on stage, do they, does it change the emotional impact uh, for you and for the reader versus the audience? Well, for me, it doesn't change the emotional impact of locomotion because I wrote the book 10 years ago, and I feel like the book has had 10 years to kind of solidify as, it's, as the book in my heart and brain. And I feel like the play feels like a different thing, even though it's part of the same. Um, so I don't think it's, it has that kind of impact. It's going to be interesting to see how it, what readers think. I think um, readers will hopefully enjoy both, and I think they will be able to see what parts are very different and, and, and reason why. The novel is, is explicitly about poetry, mm -hmm. and you're explicit about the kinds of poetry you introduce your reader to. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is the impact, and why did you choose to make a whole book of, of poetry? When I first started writing Locomotion, I knew I wanted to write about a boy learning to find his voice through poetry. And I started writing it, and I wrote, Chapter one, you know, Lonnie Collins' motion was 11 years old and lived with his mom and dad, whatever. And um, I probably got to about the third or fourth chapter, and it wasn't working, wasn't working. And I realized I was breaking the first rule of writing, which is show, don't tell. Show, don't tell. Show, don't tell. And here I was telling this story about this young boy who's writing poetry instead of showing his process as a poet. And... Um, and so then I went back to rewriting it, and I realized I, I had to write it as poetry. I had to show him struggling through the words. And I had been terrified as, of poetry as a kid. I thought it was some secret code. I thought people were trying to confuse me. I thought it was another way to make me struggle as a reader. Um, and until I discovered Langston Hughes, whose poetry, you know, just spoke and said things that I understood. And so when I started rewriting locomotion, I knew I wanted his poetry to do that. I, want, I knew I wanted it to be somewhat narrative. I wanted the line breaks to evoke something, but I didn't want it to be a secret code. I wanted people to be able to read the monsters that come at night don't have two heads come bloody and calling your name. And I wanted them to also go back and read the monsters that come at night don't, you know, so that they can see the way poetry breaks itself up. And how line breaks matter, and how two different things can happen in a poem, depending on how you read it. But I didn't want them to be confused. So I went back, and I started writing and rewriting poems. And then I read a couple of journals on how people teach fifth and sixth graders poetry. And one of um, the many things I learned is that they start by working with a lot of forms. So I knew that if I wanted the book to be realistic, that I had to give them some form. Talk about the impact of scenery uh, in the play. I, you know, the stages, the, the, the scenery changes. Mm -hmm. um, it's an intriguing set. Uh, talk about it. It's, um, I, I think of it as like when I write a picture book. When I write a picture book, I get to choose the illustrator, but then I can't talk to them, right? So I can't say, draw a picture of a girl on a tire swing or anything like that. Well, I don't get to choose the set designer, 
But um, and then basically in the picture book, I have my words and then I come in and I see the art and I'm like, whoa, that's how my words are interpreted. And this is the and then the two become the whole and it works. And I, I was really surprised by this set because I, it wasn't what I imagined. I had seen Knuffle Bunny and I love the black and white photographs and I love um, the clean lines of the set. And um, and of course, I wanted that. And I, I had this vision of what Brooklyn would be like. And um, and when I saw this set and I thought it was, oh, it's painted and um, and it's moving around and oh, there's the real bed. And and then it became a part of the whole and I understood it and I understood how it worked because I think black and white photos are something too kind of serious would add this maudlin impact to the play that I didn't want. Um, and I think something, because this, it's brightly painted and there's a lot of light when we need a lot of light and then there's always the promise of the Brooklyn Bridge behind us and the stars and, and there's something about it that, um, that kind of lets you exhale. And when the set changes, that was one of Jennifer's thing, was wanting the audience to be able to participate in what's happening, that to know that theater is not magic, that this is how it works. We change the scenes and this is what it looks like, um, which is empowering for young people. It gives them a chance to say, yeah, I can do that. Um, and I love it. I love it. I think the set is great. I can, I can sit up here. I can look at it from the audience for forever. Well, lighting is the visual cue, really, for the memory portions. You know, mm -hmm. when Monty is recalling a scene um, and, and the lights change the ambiance of the stage entirely. Mm -hmm. And the sound, I mean, the ghost, the echoing of his mom's and when his mom and dad say, well, first thing in the morning, first thing in the morning, first thing in the morning. And moments when his sister, when Lily's moving off the stage and you hear that echo. I remember the first time I saw it in preview, um, Lily's backing off the stage and, and the kid and her voice is echoing, echoing and the kid in front of me is like, is she dying? Is she dying? <laughs> and I thought, wow, that, it's just great because they, 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 they were picking up on something, but they weren't quite sure yet what they were picking up on. And I, I just love that subtlety of it and what it creates. Well, the, the way past and present merge on the stage intrigues me. Um, and there, there are certain conventions that we've we've just talked about, you know, the lighting and, and the sound, the echoey sound mm -hmm. uh, that does it. And you've seen the play several times now with, with audiences of young people. Mm -hmm. Kids pick up on this. Exactly. <laughs> they do. I, you know, kids are brilliant. <laughs> I think they, they know so much more than we do sometimes. Um, and, and, and I, you know, I don't, by knowing, I mean, their, their heart's intact and their gut is intact. And, they, and you can't pull the wool of their eyes. You can't dupe them in any way. And it's, it's what I respect so deeply about them. You know, there's not a way, the, the stage is not going to lie to them. And so, or, or if it tries to, they're not gonna buy it. And you see it in their reactions. We were talking about another play where the kids were just dancing in the aisles and, and they, um, it wasn't expected. Like, <laughs> that there was no cue to dance in the aisles, but you know, the, in mass, these kids got up and were dancing to the song. And I just love that kind of stuff. I just love that they feel it and they do it and no one has silenced them yet. And so, so I'm, when I'm writing for them, um, when I'm writing novels and picture books, and now I know when I'm writing plays, there is this deep respect that I continue to have for my audience, for my young audience. Well, there's a sequel to Locomotion um, called Peace Locomotion. Uh -huh. You use a different form, though, mm -hmm. and, but you bring us up to date with what's going on with Lonnie and Lily. Uh -huh. um, do you want to just talk briefly about Peace Locomotion? Well, in Peace Locomotion, his brother Jenkins is home for the war, from the war, and Rodney, who didn't make it into the play, is also home. These are his two foster, Mr. J Ms. Jink Ms. Edna's sons. Um, and Jenkins has been injured in the war. Lonnie has been injured emotionally because he has this teacher who tells him, he has a new teacher who says, you're, he tells her he's a poet, and she says, you're not a po poet until you've published something, and until you publish something, you're not a writer, you're an aspiring writer. And it, it silences him, it crushes him, and so 
I knew that was going to happen in the book, and I knew as a result I couldn't write another book that was written in verse because when the book opens, he's not really writing poetry until later on, until he finds his voice again. And I knew he wanted to keep a connection with Lily, so it's a book of letters that he's writing to Lily about his life and their lives. You've said that your work is emotionally autobiographical. Did anything like that ever silence you as a child? Um, you know, I think the thing about being a kid that was really, a, I was a chattery kid in some ways, and nothing ever silenced me for long. So I do remember when I wrote my poem in fifth grade, the teacher didn't believe I had written it. And so then my mom had to come in, and, you know, my mom's like, she writes all the time. This is all this girl does. And then the teacher believed it, and I ended up winning a Scrabble game. But it was that moment that was, I'm sure, devastating, because here I am, this child trying to convince this, you know, having this teacher say, you didn't write this. And, and what that means is you're not smart enough. You're not articulate enough. You've never showed me this. And all of the things that kids read into a message like that, at the same time, here I was writing something that must be good if people didn't believe I wrote it. So, so, so looking back on it, I think it was, um, it was two-sided in that it was a curse and it was a gift that I'm like, wow, I must be halfway decent. She doesn't think I wrote this. Um, but I, I'm sure it silenced me for about two seconds. So you, like Lonnie, have always kind of known that you're a poet. I'm, I'm not, I, I, I was scared of poetry, but I, I knew I wanted to write. I knew I wanted to tell stories. And I didn't know how they would get in the world, get into the world, but I knew they would somehow. Well, thank you, Jacqueline Woodson, for sharing your poetry and your emotional autobiography with us. We're going to leave you with the final scene from Locomotion. Goodbye. Camp Kaufman's in upstate New York. You go to Port Authority and take a bus for two hours and then you're there. And there's uh, horses and a lake and a swimming pool. And there's your little sister, Lily, coming too. The two of you for two whole weeks together. Well, but now it's June and you're on the bus heading to your little sister's house where soon her new mama is waiting to give you a long, hard look to see if you're dressed right for today's church service. Who said, well, I guess so, when you asked if you could go with them every Sunday even though no was so near the front of her tongue. And you go, <laughs> not because of anything else, but for the fact that you get to see your sister and sit next to her every single Sunday for two whole hours. <laughs> and after that, if the weather's nice, you and your little sister get to go to Prospect Park <laughs> and spend some more time together. Lonnie, I saw you get off the bus. I missed you. <laughs> you just saw me yesterday, silly. I know, uh, but yesterday seems like so long ago. And sometimes I get scared I'm never going to see you again. I'm your big brother. I'm here, you know that. I know, I know that. Oh, for later on, after church, I got one too. My, my foster mama says that we can sit on the stoop and wait for her just so long as I don't get my clothes dirty. Isn't this the prettiest dress you ever laid eyes on? <laughs> I'm something else. <laughs> yeah, you sure are. <laughs> Tell me a mama poem, Lonnie. You know, the one where you talk about what she used to smell like? Can you tell me that one again? Yeah. Whenever I smell honeysuckle powder, mama's alive again. And I'm remembering all kinds of good things about her. Like how she would laugh at my corny jokes and how she sounded good and bad at the same time when she sang in the shower. <laughs> and some days I comb Lily's hair, braids mostly, but sometimes a ponytail. And Lily would cry and cry, the type of crying with no tears coming out, big faker. <laughs> And daddy would come running out saying, who's hurting my baby girl? I sure hope he's a praying man. <laughs> Some days, like today and yesterday and probably tomorrow, that's all that's on my mind. Mama, daddy, and Lily. Hair and hope and honeysuckle powder, the past, and of course, poetry.